Welcome to this third video in the video series on oceans. Today we'll be talking about waves and shorelines. Learning targets for this video are to describe wave characteristics and types, to describe wave erosion and shoreline features that are produced, and to explain the differences between emergent and submergent coastlines. We'll start out this video talking about wave characteristics and the parts of a wave. So the diagram at the top of the slide shows the basic parts of a wave. We see here a wave length, that's the distance between sequential crests or the distance between sequential troughs. The crest of a wave being the top portion, the highest portion of that wave, and the trough being the lowest portion in the wave. The wave height being the height difference between the top of the crest and the bottom of the trough. As waves propagate through the ocean, they're actually moving water particles in a circular motion, and you can see that described here by these small circles. And you'll notice that the diameter of the circles becomes progressively smaller with increasing depth. In fact, wave energy decreases quickly with increasing depth so that the wave base is about one half the wave length. And below that wave base, there is negligible water movement. Let's turn now to the surf zone where a lot of that wave action takes place. We see in the diagram a wave approaching the shoreline and we see this typical circular movement of those wave particles decreasing again with depth down to the wave base. But as the wave approaches the shore and the wave base feels the bottom, feels that shoreline, something happens to those circles. They start to become more and more elliptical and you'll notice that they start to tip forward. So approaching waves are actually being chased by the waves following them. They are slowing down as they approach the shoreline. Their wave length is decreasing. and The wave height increases until the wave becomes unstable and it breaks. All of that wave action produces erosion along the shoreline. So we can think about beach materials that reflect the locally available sediments, and those beach materials are being continuously reworked by the waves. That wave action and that erosion is caused by not only the impact of the waves, but also by abrasion from particles being carried along with the waves. We have two pictures here, the top one and the bottom one, and those pictures are actually taken of the same location, just at different times of year. The top picture is taken in the summer, call that our summer beach, and the bottom picture is taken in the winter, we'll call that our winter beach. In the summer, when the waves are lighter, the waves transport sediment up the beach face, so transport the sediment landward, and because the waves are lighter, much of that swash is soaking into the beach face, and so there is limited backwash, and little sediment is carried back out to sea. So we have accumulations of sediment and this broad, wide summer beach face. Conversely, when the waves are heavier, typically in the wintertime, we have strong sediment movement in a seaward direction. So we actually have erosion of the beach face. You can see how much narrower the beach is here. What happens is those strong waves push inland, and because the swash zone is already saturated, Lots of backwash forms, and that pulls sediment back out to sea and cannibalizes the beach face. So summer beach and a winter beach caused by erosion. Also thinking about erosion and impact of waves on surfaces and shorelines that are not straight lines. We have to consider wave refraction or the bending of waves as they approach the shoreline. This concentrates wave energy on the headlands regions and reduces energy in bays where sediments might then be deposited. We can see this cartoon here that shows us a scalloped coastline and the impact of waves on that coastline. The wave energy is initially impacting these headland regions and eroding them away because the wave energy is converging on those headlands. In the bay areas, the wave energy or the wave fronts are actually diverging and so the energy is not focused and concentrated Instead, deposition occurs. We can see a similar thing with an aerial photo in the bottom left-hand corner here, where these headlands areas at the top and at the bottom of the picture are being impacted by that concentrated wave energy. And in the central portion in this bay region, 
the waves are diverging and you see this broad beach being deposited in this area. Likewise, in the picture on the bottom right, you see this headlands region that's protruding from the straighter coastline and you can see the wave energy impacting it here in a concentrated fashion. What will eventually happen is this headlands area will be eroded away and it will become a much straighter coastline. But what happens with that sediment that's transported along a shoreline? So most times impacting waves are impacting the shoreline at a slight angle. And we can see that in the diagram at the top of the page. Here come some waves from the top left corner in towards the bottom right corner. They're impacting that shoreline. And as they run up the beach face, a backwash comes straight back down the beach slope. And so what happens is we have beach drift or a net transportation of sediment along the coastline to the right side in this particular diagram. Likewise, sediment that's not on shore but is still underwater is transported up towards the beach face and transported along the beach face to the right in this particular diagram and that's known as a longshore current or longshore transport. In the bottom picture we can see an example from the real world of what happens. To try to stabilize this shoreline there have been groins built out into the water perpendicular to the shoreline and what you see here is you see longshore transport moving that sediment towards the top of the picture. You see past the first groin, the beach face comes inland, and towards the second groin, it's moving out along the groin again. So that's indicating longshore transport along the coastline here. So what happens in terms of erosional features? We have features such as wave-cut cliffs, wave-cut platforms, marine terraces, all of these things happen as the surf erodes the land surface along a coastline. So let's look at some of the features. In the top diagram, we see wave action attacking this steep coastline and cutting this cliff away. So an undercut notch here, and it's going to erode away the cliff. The land that's beneath the wave zone here forming a wave cut platform. In the next picture down, we can see that sea level has fallen a little bit in this region or it's at low tide and the wave cut platform is fully exposed and the wave cut cliff is also exposed here, although it's starting to retreat. In the bottom picture here, we see an example of other features that are common in areas that feature wave cut cliffs and those are sea caves, sea arches, and stacks. What happens in this situation is large cracks begin to open up because of hydraulic action. Waves impact them and increase their size until sometimes they will form an arch. That arch may collapse, separating this tower from the land, which may then erode away to form stacks. And we can see a beautiful example of that same situation here, where we have the arch, the sea arch, and several stacks that have already been separated from this marine land. If you look at this flat surface at the top, this is a great example of a wave cut terrace or a marine terrace here. And in the picture on the bottom right hand side, we can see the wave cut platform just along here and a marine terrace here indicating that there has been some uplift in this area. Some depositional features that form as a result of sediment being moved around. First of all, it's important to remember that sediment is deposited in areas where wave energy is low. And so we have four different features. We'll start with a spit. Spits form when longshore transport continues to move sand across a bay mouth. So you can see this bay back in the back top corner of the picture, and the sand moving from the bottom left corner towards the top right corner has formed this sand spit. The sand spit may completely close off that bay mouth. In the second picture, we see an example of the sand spit that has crossed across the entire mouth of the bay and blocked it off, and that is a bay mouth bar. In the bottom right corner picture, we see what was left of a sea stack that is now connected to this mainland area only by some sediment, and that sediment connection is called a tombolo deposit. 
And in the two pictures at the bottom, we see examples of barrier islands. So barrier islands form parallel to coastlines. They're low sandy ridges, and they are added to by longshore transport. Finally, talking about emergent and submergent coastlines. Emergent coastlines are the result of rising land or falling sea level, which exposes wave cut cliffs and platforms above the sea level and exposes marine terraces. In this picture, we can see these narrow wave cut platforms in this little bay. We can see active cutting of a wave cut cliff and we can see a former platform that's now elevated and that's a marine terrace. Just the opposite situation with a submergent coast. A submergent coast forms when shorelines have been submerged and these are common when we see drowned river valleys or drowned river mouths that are forming estuaries. Great example of this is Chesapeake Bay, which we see an example of in the top picture. You'll notice that these river channels would have flown all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. However, sea level has risen and has drowned those river valleys and formed that bay or that estuary. So that's a submergent coastline. I think we're ready to go back and check our learning targets. We described the wave characteristics and types. We described erosion and shoreline features that are produced. And we talked about the differences between emergent and submergent coasts. Go ahead and take your mastery check quiz and I'll see you in class.